thank you so much for the nice introduction and thanks for this great talk, um, for this um, great invitation. Okay, so uh, this is joint work with Jesus Fernandez Vedaverde, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, and Harald Ulrich, who's at the University of Chicago. And um, well, so the, the idea of the talk is to talk, well, to, to look at classic goals of central banking in contrast to financial intermediation, essentially. But so let me quickly give them an introduction to CBDC, um, but well, Andreas already talked, talked a little bit about this. So we, we know that um, several uh, policy making institutions are debating the introduction of a CBDC. So they're actively researching, uh, running pilots and so on. But um, depending on the institution that you're talking to, the term CBDC varies a lot, um, can mean a new digital payment system, a new digital currency, but also accounts that citizens can hold at the central bank. And so uh, the version of a CBDC that I will talk about today is exactly a so-called account-based CBDC, where uh, citizens are going to have electronic 24-7 access to the central bank's balance sheet. And so this is a notion that was also introduced by Bardair and Kumov by the Bank of England. So it's not something that we came up with, but we just take this um, security design as given and just moving forward uh, with it. Okay, so the idea of the talk is, or the, the idea of the paper is as follows. Um, so CBDC are essentially going to be um, a short-term liability on the central bank's balance sheet. And as, as citizens start investing in CBDC, the central bank will have to come up with um, a, a way to, to invest these funds. And so central banks are not new to, to investing in the economy. In fact, since the financial crisis, we have been seeing quantitative easing happening on large scale. So central banks have already been investing. And with the introduction of a CBDC, this kind of investment can happen on a larger scale um, in a different research project with the same set of co-authors joined with Daniel Sanchez, what we're essentially showing is that if central banks are coexisting and competing with private banks in the deposit market, then central banks have in fact um, the capacity to, to attract a lot of deposits simply because they might be perceived as safer. And so potentially they can they can arise as a deposit monopoly, but generically they have the potential to really attract a lot of the deposit markets so that maturity transformation by central banks can occur on large scale. Yeah, so they are going to attract a lot of CBDC, a lot of short-term uh, deposits on the one hand, and then potentially going to invest a lot in the economy. Yeah. And so what this essentially means is that the central bank is going to um, take on a new role in addition to the classic role that, that a central bank has. So we know that uh, a classic central bank objective is to keep prices stable, uh, to keep the euro stable, the dollar stable. But with um, the role of a financial intermediator, um, new objectives arise. And these objectives have been well studied in the literature on financial intermediation, but have not so much been discussed in the context of central banking. Um, so. Uh, with financial intermediation, for instance, a classic goal is to attain so-called optimal risk sharing allocations. Yeah, I, will, I will let you know exactly what that means. And the goal is, of course, also to be uh, not susceptible to runs. Yeah. And uh, so the, the question arises, to what extent do these two objectives compete with price stability? Is it possible to... Um, attain all these three objectives at the same point in time or, well, and to what extent do they compete with one another? Yeah, so the idea of the paper is to look at potential internal conflicts of interest that arise as central banks enter the business of financial intermediation. And uh, well, the, the main result of the paper is that it's in fact not possible to attain three goals, uh, these three goals at the same uh, point in time. So. What I'm going to do in the next um, 35 minutes is I will walk you through a sequence of three results where I will pin down one objective and then I show you that at least one other objective is going to be violated. And uh, so altogether, these three results form an impossibility result. These, these three objectives are generically not attained at the same point in time and we call this the CBDC uh, trilemma. 
Now, uh, you, you might wonder, what does it actually going to mean, a run on the central bank? Because we know that central banks are the issue of currency. So it, it cannot happen that a, run, uh, that, that a run forces a central bank to run, to run out of notes. So a central bank can always deliver nominal obligations. It's not the case that you're going to walk to the central bank and you want to withdraw uh, $10 and so on, and then the central bank cannot deliver. Uh, central banks can, can print money. So uh, that, that's not going to be the case. What we mean instead here is a run on the central bank will take the form of a run on the price level. So in form of uh, high inflation, but um, we will get, uh, I will get much more concrete here. Okay. So there is a literature on financial intermediation that we are drawing on extensively. In particular, we are drawing on the paper by Damon and Dipvig in 1983. Um, this has become a very famous banking model, which introduces the role of uh, banks as financial intermediators. And um, then we're also extensively building on a literature strand that uses so-called nominal contracts to describe the relationship between citizens and the bank. And uh, so the, the main innovation that we have in the paper is that in the paper, not only citizens are going to behave in a strategic way, but also the central bank will. And the central bank will understand the incentives of its citizens and then take actions to counteract uh, incentives of citizens. Yeah. Okay, so just to, to build on the model, I will explain to you first in detail the diamond dip big model. Yeah, so it's the classic model in financial intermediation. And then I will show you um, how the central bank's role is going to interact uh, in, in this kind of setup. Okay, so in diamond and dip big, there are three time periods and there's a continuum of small agents and you think of these agents as citizens and so these agents are born at time zero and they are symmetric and each endowed with one unit of a real good and you can think of it as an apple so they're born with one apple and these agents want to shift consumption of this apple across time um, so there are two future time periods now the thing is at in the next time period in the interim uh, time period the agents are going to learn something about themselves. Namely, they will learn whether they will die at the end of, of time one or whether they will live another day until time two. Um, and so the agents that are going to die at time one, we, we call them impatient types. And those that live for another time period, they're called patient. So the impatient types, they're called impatient because they instantly have to consume at time one because since they will die, they don't care about tomorrow's consumption at time two. But otherwise, um, so these types of the agents are private information. I cannot see what kind of type you have, and you can't see my type. Okay, so all agents share um, the same kind of utility function um, with a risk aversion coefficient greater than one. And now, so in this economy where all these agents are born, uh, there's a one real technology which allows to shift apple consumption across time. And so the technology works the following way. You invest one apple in this technology at time zero. And then at time one, the, the technology acts like storage. Yeah. So one apple to invested today will yield one apple tomorrow. But if you stay invested for a long time, time, uh, time horizon until time two, this apple is going to grow very large and for sure. And now, so it, Imagine these, um, these citizens, they are born at time zero, each having one apple. There's this one technology available to shift apple consumption across time. They're all going to invest at time zero, investing their apple in the technology. At time one, these agents get up in the morning and they learn their type. Now, if they turn out to be impatient, they instantly have to consume, meaning they will liquidate the technology and only consume one apple, one small apple. If the agent was lucky, the agent turns out to be patient lives until time two, and that is going to be able to consume this very large apple. And so this makes this agent very happy. Now, what Diamond and Dipvik showed in 1983 is that these agents are so worried about being the impatient type that they are willing to write contracts at time zero, uh, which look the following way. Yeah, so the contract is going to promise an impatient type a little bit more of an apple at time one, namely a 
x1 star strictly greater than one. Now you could uh, think about how is this possible to give an impatient type more than one unit, given that the technology works like this. Well, so this can be accomplished through banks. So what, what a bank is going to do is the bank is going to pool resources at time zero. So she's going to collect all the apples of these agents, invest these apples in the real technology on behalf of the agents. And then at time one, as the agents learn that type, they can walk to the bank and can say, dear bank, I'm the impatient type. Give me X1 star, please. X1 star greater one. And so the bank is going to hand over X1 star units of apples um, to the agent without knowing whether this is truly an impatient type or not. Um, so the optimal location X1 star can be implemented if all agents behave truthfully according to their type. But uh, well, if a patient type decides to mimic the impatient type and also demand X1 star at time one, this is not going to work out. And this is a so-called bank run. So the reason is, how is this X1 star actually financed? Well, the bank can provide X1 star, yeah, so an interest rate um, to the impatient types simply by liquidating a small proportion of the patient types investment already at time one. And therefore patient types that roll over their investment until time two, they don't get capital R, they get a little bit less. Yeah. And so as long as patient agents or all agents behave according to their type, this is fine. And this is going to work out and the socially optimal allocation is attained. But patient agents might have an, in, an incentive to mimic the impatient type, namely if they anticipate a panic to happen. So what's a panic? A panic is the following. As imagine you're a patient type. You could actually wait with your consumption until time two. But now you might fear that there are many other patient types out there that are going to behave like the impatient type and demand X1 star at time one. Then you know, because this technology is very illiquid, the bank is not going to be able to pay X1 star to all agents at time one. Eventually the, the bank is going to liquidate the entire investment. And if you actually behave like your type and wait until time two, there will be nothing left for you. Yeah. So this is the, the so-called bank run equilibrium, which occurs in Diamond and Divvig. And very important is this bank run equilibrium only exists because the bank is willing to be fragile and provide an allocation strictly greater one. Yeah. So attaining the socially optimal allocation is uh, requires necessarily the bank to be fragile. And the central bank can overcome this dilemma using inflation as a threat yeah, and using nominal contracts. And, and I will show you uh, now how. Okay, so what is the central bank going to do with CBDC? So now what we're going to impose that contracts are not denominated in apples. Yeah, so this is a contract that's denominated in apples and the technology works in terms of apples. Now the contract will be written in a nominal form in terms of CBDC. Okay, so how does it work? The agent walks to the central bank at time zero, hands over the apple, and in return receives a contract that specifies if the agent uh, learns his type in time one and decides to spend CBDC, then she can spend M units. Yeah, so. M is a quantity of CBDC that the agent can spend on consumption goods. If the agent decides to not spend at time one, but rather spend late, the agent can spend a little bit more on consumption goods. Yeah. Now, from the perspective of the central bank, it works the following way. The agents walk all to the central bank and hand over the apples endowment. Yeah, and you can think of these apples as, as labor. The central bank pools all these endowments and invests them in the technology that is given here. At time one, then the agents learn their types and uh, there is something like a, a spending share among the agents. So it's the, the share of agents that are deciding to spend CBDC at time one. And this is an equilibrium object. This is going to be endogenous. And now the central bank observes total CBDC spending and only then decides how much of the asset to liquidate and essentially decides on the goods provision in the market. And now 
as these goods are then sold to the agents that spend CBDC, there's a price level P1 that has to clear the market. Yeah, so the price is such that total CBDC supply is equivalent to the value of goods that are provided in the market. Likewise, at time two, there's a remaining goods endowment. So the remaining investment matures and agents who do not spend at time one, they will spend at time two. And there's a price level at time two then that clears the market. Now, we say that a run on the central bank at this point is just the incidence that patient agents are consuming or are, are spending CBDC early. Yeah. And so this is an important slide. So let's have a look at this a little bit more in detail. So what does it actually mean? So these, these patient types that are spending early, they, they are not interested in eating apples early. Yeah. So they, they want to consume apples later. Nevertheless, they go to the market and they spend their CBDC units right now, store these apples under the mattress until tomorrow and eat them then. Okay. And so what is actually happening here is that the CBDC forfeits its purpose as a store of value. Yeah, so because we, we, as the definition of CBDC, a currency, the, the distinguishing feature of a currency is that it acts as a store of value. This is no longer the case if a run happens. Yeah. So as agents start to spend strategically on apples today, because they are worried that there are no apples available tomorrow, the store of value function switches from the CBDC away to the consumption good, to the apples. It's the apple now that's the store of value. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay. So, and we will see that the cause of that is anticipated scarcity of goods tomorrow or anticipated lack of purchasing power. And so what we see is that if you expect scarcity of goods tomorrow, if you expect future inflation, this is going to cause hyperinflation today. And now you might think, well, this is still a little bit cryptic, you know, but what did we see in March, 2020? Yeah, so we walked into the supermarket. There were no pasta to buy. There was no toilet paper to buy. This is scarcity of goods happening. Yeah, so it's essentially as the first come first serve uh, mechanism that's here in place, very very similar to to a bank run. Yeah, so technically, um, a, as a run on the commercial bank happens, people are running on the bank, and if you're if you're lucky, you're early in the queue and you're served your deposit. But if you're late, there's nothing left for you. And this is happening here. So there's nothing left for you. This is first come first serve in the supermarket. Yeah, and so. This is essentially what's happening here is that people are using pasta as a store of value because it's not that these uh, citizens all of a sudden have a huge need for pasta. It's rather that they buy the pasta, store it in their basement uh, until tomorrow. Yeah, so storing value in terms of in terms of food. Linda, and the way, uh, yes. uh, sorry, I have a question about finish what your, your thought train and then. I oh, okay, so so what's the thing is. The way we see it here is as the agents anticipate scarcity of goods at time two, what they're doing is they're essentially hoarding at time one and purchasing more than they need instantaneously and start storing value in terms of goods. Yeah. And so a run on the central bank is the feature that an agent that only wants to consume actually tomorrow goes into the supermarket on the goods market and purchases uh, goods today and stores them essentially in private. Okay. Yeah. So there's a question. Yeah. Uh, two things. If lambda lambda is the uh, share of impatience, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So if the share is very small, this condition kind of like uh, it's easier to 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 be satisfied. The condition for the run, for um, the for the run. And, and so if you have an intuition there to tell me why, I was expecting. The second thing about the, your example, the, the hoarding mechanism that we saw in, in 2020 was because of uh, a fear of disruption of production in the future, not a fear of higher prices. It's still the, a, a scarcity problem, I understand, but like the source of but the run there. Like, but what, but, okay, but that's pretty much the same. I mean, inflation is that there are goods in the supermarket and they're more expensive, but the extreme form is that there are no goods even left. Yeah. But um, so I will, I will come to this. Let me quickly address the first thing. So the quant, the, the, the share of agents that will spend is um, an endogenous 
share. So it's an equilibrium object, meaning that this is going to adopt to the lambda. Yeah, and uh, so if lambda is small, it can be that the n is uh, not greater than lambda more often. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to adopt. In the end, it's not going to matter for the central mechanism, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will come to. I will come back if I have time to the empty shelves at the end of the talk because exactly about this, I, I would like to talk a little bit more. But I just want to clarify at this point. So a run on the central bank is happening if there are agents that are not in need of um, consumption today, but nevertheless they are uh, essentially trading CBDC for consumption goods and storing these goods in their basement to consume tomorrow. Yeah? And so the question that we still need to figure out is why are they doing this and how can we keep them from doing that? Okay, so let's have a look at market clearing. Okay, let me walk you through these equations. <clears throat> so remember, N is the share of agents who decide to spend CBDC at time one. Each of them spends a quantity M of CBDC. So this here is the total quantity of CBDC that is brought into the market. Now, the central bank observes the share of agents that uh, spend CBDC, is going to provide or liquidate and then provide this quantity of goods. And then the price level P1 uh, clears the market. So P1 is such that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Likewise, at time two, there's a share of agents that um, have not spent at time one. So these are spending at time two, each of them spending this quantity of, uh, of uh, currency. And the right-hand side, you have this quantity of goods that are supplied in the market. So this is just maturing investment. And then there's a price level P2 that again clears the market. Now let's solve these two market clearing equations for the price level. And you see, so classically, central banks want to keep prices stable. But you see at this point in time, these price levels are fully flexible in the spending behavior of the agent. Yeah. So in, let's say in, in normal times, if there is no panic, then here exactly lambda agents, the impatient types are spending early. And so the remaining agents are spending late. So you have here a um, constancy in the uh, numerator. And then depending on how much the central bank is going to provide in goods, you can achieve a price stability technically, yeah. But generically, price levels are fully flexible in the spending behavior of the agents at this point in time, and also flexible in the quantity of goods that are provided by the central bank. Uh, so just at this point, we are not imposing price stability. Instead, what we're looking at is under what circumstances would an agent spend early rather than late? And so when is this the case? Well, depending on the quantity of goods that are provided by the central bank at time one, you can calculate the real allocation to uh, the individual real allocation that an agent would receive when spending a quantity M of CBDC. Yeah, so as the agent walks to the market, spends M units of CBDC, she receives the total quantity of goods provided by the central bank shared by all agents that are spending early. And likewise, at time two, how much does this quantity CBDC buy? Well, it buys the total quantity of goods that are brought to the market shared by all agents that are spending late. And you see here the role of the central bank. Yeah, so there is here an externality going on. The more goods the central bank provides early at time one, so the more she has to liquidate, the fewer she can provide at time two. And so and the agents anticipate that. So the citizens understand that if there's a lot of interruption of production processes happening, the more interruption there is, the fewer goods are there tomorrow. Okay. And so now the role of the central bank when trying to deter agents from spending early is to control the quantity of goods that are provided. Okay. So what equilibrium concept are we using? So remember, we have, we have the central bank and the agents as strategic players. We have price levels that have to clear markets. So a commitment equilibrium is spending behavior by the agents, um, a central bank policy, which is announced at time zero, and price levels so that the spending behavior of the agents is optimal given the announced policy. Yeah, so the central bank announces how much to liquidate, the nominal interest rate, and the money supply. 
then the spending behavior, given the spending behavior realization of the agents, the central bank is then indeed going to liquidate the announced quantity of goods and is going to set the announced nominal interest rate. Yeah. So remember the announcement came at time zero, then agents are spending at time one. And then given the spending behavior of the agents, the central bank liquidates an according amount and sets an interest rate. And finally, the price levels have to clear uh, the goods market. Yeah, so at this point, prices fl flexibly adjust to the announced policy and to the spending behavior. We do not impose uh, price stability. Now the question remains, remember the question that we're working at is under what circumstances do patient agents strategically spend CBDC early on consumption goods and store them under the mattress? So when is this the case? So a central bank run where all patient agents spend CBDC early. This is an equilibrium if and only if conditional on all agents spending early. In fact, the real allocation, yeah, so the quantity of goods that they would receive at time one is larger than the quantity of goods that they received at time two. Yeah, so this is ex post saying that ex post they made the right decision to run on the central bank at time one. It was the right decision to spend CBDC early because they could by CBDC could buy them more at time one than at time two. Vice versa, the fact so, or the, the feature that only the inpatient types are spending early, this is an equilibrium only if conditional on only inpatient IHS are spending, the allocation at time one is in fact below the allocation at time two. Yeah. So this feature does not harm the inpatient types because they only care for the early consumption and for the patient agents, this is great because it means they made, sorry, they made the right decision to not spend early because at time two, they get more. Yeah, and now the question remains, how can the central bank prevent runs from happening? Well, she does so by uh, pinning down a particular kind of liquidation policy. Okay, so how, how should this look like? Well, the central bank can implement the social optimum and dominant strategies if a conditional on the inpatient type spending early, she has to liquidate enough uh, of the technology to provide the optimum amount. But now here comes the flip side. So the central bank has to take care that if there is a lot of spending going on, a lot of, um, yeah. So if agents are essentially running on the supermarket to spend CBDC, then the central bank has to take care that these agents regret their, their decision. Yeah. And in the sense that she has to take care that waiting had been ex post optimum. Yeah. So if, if there are agents, patient agents spending CBDC early, they would have received more had they waited until time two. This is what this condition is saying. Yeah. And so the central bank tries to, tries to find an according uh, liquidation policy, why? So that if there is high level spending happening, if there are many agents that are running on the supermarket, the central bank strategically pulls on the supply, reduces the supply in a way that these agents that are shopping, they made the wrong decision and um, had received more if they had spent late. And so we call this kind of policy a run deterrent policy because remember the central bank sets this policy at time zero. Yeah and is fully committed to this policy. So if it's if this policy is credible, the announcement, so essentially this is an announcement. If many of you guys run on the supermarket tomorrow, I will not, go, I will not supply a lot of apples in the market, and, uh, but instead I will supply a lot, a lot of apples uh, the day after tomorrow. So it, for you, it rather pays off to wait uh, until the day after tomorrow and not spend today. Now, if this announcement at time zero is credible, um, this policy is mandatory. Why? Because, because if the agents, if the patient agents believe that this threat is actually executed, it deters them from spending early. It deters them because they know at time two, they receive more. So it's a, it's a threat that's not executed in equilibrium. Okay. So how does, how does the threat exactly look like? Well, on the x-axis here, you see uh, all possible spending behavior of the agents. So you would always observe at least lambda agents uh, spending CBDC on, on goods in the supermarket. 
Um, but patient agents can also walk to the supermarket to spend. So you, you would observe spending behavior in this range. The social optimal allocation is attained if, if inpatient types are spending that the central bank liquidates a Y star. And generically, for all possible spending levels, the central bank should provide a quantity of goods in the market that is below the red line. And you see that there are infinitely many, so the constraint is not too harsh, but there's certainly a constraint. The liquidation policy cannot cross the red line, but has to stay below. So now this is the first part of, of the trilemma and it says the following. Um, Every policy that is announced by the central bank at time zero, which would liquidate the optimal amount if only inpatient types spend early, but liquidates very little if there's also spending happening by patient types. This kind of policy deters central bank grants and implements the socially optimal allocation and dominant strategies. Now that's because it, it deters the run from happening ex ante and all agents are going to behave according to that type. The flip side is if you shorten, so if off, off equilibrium path, if it, it happened that a lot of patient types would nevertheless spend, and if the central bank in fact has to uh, go through and provide very little goods in the market, this just translates one to one into having a very high price level. Yeah, and just imagine there are 100 people all spending $500 on five apples in the supermarket. The price level that would clear the market will be very high. The apple price would be very high. So this means that um, for deterring the run, the central bank has to threaten with inflation. But in equilibrium, the threat is not executed. If the threat is credible, it has to be credible. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Now, um, let me quickly uh, address so the, the kind of shortening of the good supply it reminds a little bit of, um, of what, what uh, is called suspension of convertibility in banking. So suspension of convertibility is that there is, for instance, a run on the commercial bank happening and uh, people are trying to get their money out of the bank. And at some point, the bank, in order to um, uh, hand out money, has to liquidate assets. That's very costly. So at some point in time, the regulator is going to step in before the bank runs out of assets and is going to stop the run. And this means that people that are early in the queue, they are in fact served the deposit, but agents that are, that are late in the queue, they, they will get nothing. Yeah. So this is not happening here because the central bank is not preventing spending behavior. Yeah. So all agents can spend uh, their CBDC uh, whenever they want, but the mechanism works through the good supply. And this is also, um, it's a nice feature because it means that the mechanism not only applies to account-based CBDC, but can also apply to token-based CBDC as long as the goods market is centralized. Yeah, so it, it, the mechanism works through the goods supply and not through uh, the rationing of, of currency. Okay, so what I've shown to you is basically as long as the central bank is willing to abandon price stability, she can always deter runs and uh, implement these socially optimal allocation and dominant strategies. But, but we know that price stability is a classic goal of central banking and we're not bringing this objective back in. Um, and a different way you can see this is, so we are going to impose price stability and a, a way to see this also is to have a price stickiness. Yeah, the prices are not, cannot be renegotiated at any point in time. Okay, so what do we mean with price stability? Let's have a look at the market clearing equations again. We say that a central bank policy is stable at a price level P bar at time one, if no matter the spending behavior of the agents, so for every spending behavior, this price level does not move. Yeah, so we're imposing that the left-hand side here is constant, no matter the realization of spending. And you instantly see that this constrains the central bank very much in her liquidation policy. Now the question is, if you have this kind of stable uh, prices, can the liquidation policy still be such that uh, the socially optimal allocation is implemented and can still runs on the bank be deterred? So the answer is yes and no. Um, so first of all, what's going to happen is 
we have now reversed the order in which, uh, so the, the, the policy by the central bank will have to follow the price level and the spending behavior. Yeah, so we have a constraint on, on the policy. What you can show is if the central bank wants to keep the price level stable, no matter what, then she will have to provide goods in a proportional uh, way to the spending behavior. So the more agents are going to the supermarket and demanding pasta, uh, the more pasta you have to provide in order to keep the price stable. Yeah, so th that makes sense. But the problem is a little bit, the, the central bank is constrained in her liquidation because we know that the central bank could never liquidate more than the entire investment. So there's a natural feasibility constraint because the liquidation has to be below one. This gives you a constraint on the slope. Yeah, so uh, it, it means that in order to have, um, in order to be able to liquidate on a constant line for all possible spending behavior, the individual real allocation has to be below one. And that's bad news because, well, the central bank, uh, the socially optimal allocation requires the real allocation to exceed one. Yeah, so this means immediately that under a fully price stable policy, the social optimal allocation is not attainable. Yeah. But nevertheless, on the flip side, um, the real allocation at time one is so low that patient types are not interested in uh, running on the central bank early and spending CBDC early. And you see this uh, most nice on, on this, uh, this graphic. So here again, you have the aggregate spending behavior, uh, which is somewhere between the uh, measure of inpatient types and one. In order to keep the price stable, you have to liquidate starting the origin on a, a straight line. And you have a natural uh, limit on the slope because here you hit feasibility. You cannot liquidate more than the entire investment. And so a slope that is higher than one is not possible, not under a fully price stable policy. And you see that for retaining the social optimal location, you would need to reach this point, but that's not possible. Yeah, so not with a fully price stable policy. Okay, so, uh, well, so this is the second part of the trilemma. And um, again, bad news. So if the central bank wants to keep prices truly stable in aggregate spending behavior, the social optimal allocation cannot be attained. And um, well, the, because it cannot be attained, the um, liquidation has to be low, meaning that patient agents are not interested in spending CBDC early because the allocation is so low. Yeah. And so there's an equivalence to uh, Diamond and Dipley because they also show that, um, well, in order to, to in, yeah, in order to supply the social optimal location, the bank has to be fragile. So here the bank's not fragile. Okay, so what we need to do in my last two minutes is um, the central bank, if she wants to reach the social optimal location, she has to soften the price stability objective. Uh, and I think the best way uh, can show you this in a graph. So softening price stability means either you keep the price level stable at one, uh, at, at the level, at the target level, or you liquidate the entire investment. This means, well, you, you want to attain this point here. You want to attain the social optimal location. But then naturally, you're going to hit feasibility here, the constraint, and then you cannot do anything else than liquidating the total amount of uh, investment. This means there exists um, a critical spending level, NC, at which, well, the entire investment is liquidated, meaning that at time two, there is no investment left to mature. So the allocation at time two is a zero for all agents that behave for all patient agents that behave according to their type. Yeah. And so the, the price level is stable um, for spending behavior in between uh, the uh, share of inpatient types and this critical spending level. But this year is very bad news. Why? And let me show you in a graph. So here the uh, partially stable policy crosses the run deterring um, target line. And this means at this point here, it's the case that the real allocation to agents that spend early equals the allocation at term two at, to agents that spend late. As more spending goes up, the central bank has to liquidate more to stabilize prices. But this means that the allocation at time two drops below the allocation at time one, 
And so patient agents anticipate this happening, uh, meaning that the panic equilibrium is essentially back, uh, back on, on, on the table. So what, what this means, so I'm finishing now, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, if you run a partially price stable policy, then you have central bank runs uh, can reoccur, um, in which case the price level is not stable and the social optimum is not uh, attained. There is nevertheless a good equilibrium where the price level is stable and the social optimum is not attained. Okay, so let me come to my conclusion. Okay, so this is a model of a nominal of a, of a CBDC. Um, the central bank can always deliver on nominal obligations, but nevertheless runs occur on the central bank in form of runs on the price level. Uh, let me also mention that this mechanism is not specific to CBDC. So we're discussing in the paper um, how this applies to the current uh, sector, to, to, to the current financial system. But of course, through the introduction of CBDC, this mechanism becomes much more direct. There is also, uh, we're also talking about well, there's a trick how you can attain three objectives at the same time. So you can have a run deterrent policy and keep the price level stable. But the way to do this is through rationing or the suspension of spending. This is potentially something that you do not want to have because rationing, yeah, what, you, what we saw in Germany that you can only buy one package of toilet paper or only one bread, one bar of soap, one, one package of sugar. Yeah, so this happened last year. This essentially means you go to the supermarket, you want to spend $100 but you're only allowed to purchase this quantity of goods. You're, you're only allowed to spend $20. So what, what do you do with the remaining 80? If rationing continues to go on every day, you essentially can put the remaining 80 euros or dollars in, into the shredder. You cannot use them, meaning they have no value. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. And um, if you have questions. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, very interesting talk. Uh, we can probably take a very quick question. Uh, from the audience. Um, uh, I have one, Jing, if, I, if oh, I may. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's about the last point, actually, the last uh, idea of the CBDC uh, for Linda. Like the, so you, you use CBDC to justify. So it's a very nice result, very interesting. But the, the initial assumption that you have this CBDC technology that allow you to write these contracts, basically you are replacing the, the bank sector with some sort of uh, central banking driven. Yes. Uh, couldn't be the same situation happen. So why do you need CDC is my question. Like uh, it could be just say, we nationalize the, the bank system and all the same results will go through, seems to me. Maybe I'm wrong and that's what I'm You don't wrong. have to nationalize the banking system. Yes. No, not. instead of having the CBDC, I will say we nationalize all the bank system. Now the central bank runs this operation. Uh, shouldn't all the results go through? The mechanism hold, yes. So um, indirectly, if I can, I'm not sure whether I can go back to the slide. So what we're explaining in the paper is that indirectly the mechanism exists. I mean, nowadays what you have is you have additional layers of agents. So you, for instance, um, you have firms and banks between, between the central bank and between households. And you have households um, investing in the firm, they're real good. So think of labor, yeah. Um, you walk to the firm, you're providing labor. Um, but for the firm to produce, the firm needs more input goods, such as, I don't know, needs other input goods in order to purchase input good goods, it needs a, a loan from the bank. Where does this loan come from? Well, the central bank purchases a bond from the bank in terms of reserves, so the bank can provide the loan to the firm and so on. And then moving forward, is there, so the question is, can the central bank enforce liquidation of real, real, techno, or real technology? Technically, yes. So the central bank, if the central bank refuses to roll over bonds yeah, uh, from, from the bank, the bank essentially might call the loan from the firm and the firm then can no longer produce and has to liquidate the production technology. So it's, it's not specific to CBDC, that is true. But the CBDC makes it much more, makes the mechanisms much more direct. And um, so the role or the, the tension between price stability and financial intermediation, I think it becomes much more pronounced, much more direct. But the mechanism, uh, yes, it already but, is. But if you have a, a technology that allows you to establish and run a CBDC, wouldn't the same technology like a blockchain DLT system allows you also to implement something like a, a verification of your state, of, of your Lambda state uh, somehow? So if, if you have such a technology so advanced, I believe that you could also come up, come up, and this is going to be much better, but to, to reveal your state and pledge it to the blockchain 
and so now this problem of like a, at least the first leg of the trilemma will be uh, avoided. So blockchain to, to the best of my knowledge, they, they not actively conduct a monetary policy yet. So it's, it's not that uh, the Bitcoin is, is, is lending to, to the real economy uh, at this point. So it's, you know, it's, I think the paper is about the confrontation of conducting monetary policy on the one hand and, and uh, conducting maturity transformation on the other. Um, so, so with, with blockchain, it's at this point, I, I don't see the, the contrast as, as directly. Uh, uh, Linda, I think that what Andrea was trying to say is to use the, the, the blockchain introduces in market design a new possibility, which is that of really enforceable and therefore credible commitment. So that you can uh, somehow log yourself in and then uh, whenever you want to be paid or not, it's not enough uh, to look whatever you report later, but whatever you report in the past about yourself. And that's what you're saying, Andrea? Correct, Silvia, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so... So in other words, Andrea wonders um, a model as is usual, and your model is not, not different than any other model. It works within certain constraints of what is possible and what is possible. And so I think that um, 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 in Linda's model, there is no blockchain. There is no possibility of doing this commitment um, uh, beforehand. I think that's the answer, Andrea. And therefore, actually, Emma holds. If you change the model, if you have a blockchain, maybe things uh, this could be simplified. But, but yeah, yeah, it was a question about these assumptions, essentially. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sylvia. I think I have to, I have to think about it a little bit more. Um, I think there's a way to, I mean, you can, you can implement commitment in the blockchain. I think that's, that's not the issue, but uh, it's, it's more about the tension of how would the blockchain if the blockchain or if let's say the mining consortium does not land to the real economy then there is no way that they can also enforce liquidation of the real economy you know this is this is where, where i see it that is currently uh not working if you had um lending going on uh from some kind of token consortium to the real economy um you know they they could mine tokens um in a cost-free way lend to the real economy in the future, the real economy can 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 pay back, and then this token could be eliminated. Yeah. So crucially is that these tokens are pretty much mined in in a cost free way because so, I mean yeah you, the reason why the central bank can so easily conduct monetary policy is also they can uh, mine money in a, in a cost free way. It doesn't cost them anything to print additional bills. Yeah? And so it's very different from Bitcoin, where it's super costly to, to produce a coin. So you you would not uh, burn a Bitcoin because it was simply too costly to mine. So if, if there is a token consortium that would start lending to the real economy and then um, could, could enforce uh, uh, the interruption of production, then you are back exactly to this to the setting. But so for that to happen, you really would need to be able to um, mine tokens in a pretty much cost-free way so that it doesn't hurt you when you burn tokens. Yeah. I think we should probably move the discussions to offline. Uh, I saw there's a hand uh, raised from the audience. Filippo, do you still want to ask, uh, have your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda, for your uh, presentation. Um, I just had a quick question about, I understand that your uh, mechanism is, uh, is still uh, there with intermediaries, but it's kind of more, you have like more layers. And so it's like more, uh, indirect and maybe more less concerning. So would, for example, like uh, I saw some policy discussion on like introducing a cap on the uh, maximum holdings of like central bank CBDCs help like ameliorating your concerns on uh, price stability and this, and this dilemma. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so in fact, that wouldn't be the case, um, a cap so it turns out that in the model, uh, monetary quantities do not matter so much. And the reason is that we have monetary neutrality. So that the agents are very much focused on the quantity of real goods that the CBDC can buy. And therefore, if you, um, 
if you have a uniform cap for all agents, so if uh, then, then it doesn't matter. So um, if all of us are only able to have say, five units of CBDC in the account, um, it, the, this doesn't matter. And so the assumption in the paper is that we all have the same kind of CBDC account because we're all born with the same quantity of, of real goods with apples. So the, it turns out that this is, it doesn't matter at all, the cap. What, so the crucial policy variable is really the, the liquidation and since it's the real backing behind the CBDC. So the quantity of apples that CBDC can buy today versus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thank you.